Okay, th thank you very much for uh, way too kind words and um, for also inv having uh, invited me to, to present. Uh, where is like a bunch of uh, results that I've assembled uh, over my um, research time. That's a bit less organized than uh, Mars, so I cannot really qualify it as a as tapas, but uh, most, more like a soup maybe of results. <laughs> is um, about the past, present, and future of productivity in Europe. And essentially, I will be talking about you know drivers that explain these figures that you may may have seen before. This is GDP per capita in the euro area, reconstituted euro area uh, since the end of the 19th century. And GDP per capita on average grew by 2.1% since 1819, which is much more than what we experience today. And in fact, if you look at this, which is in log scale, you would see that most of the gains are concentrated over a relatively short period, 1950 to 1980 during which consumption per capita was multiplied by three in European countries. And at the same time, working time uh, was reduced by 400 hours on average per capita. So it means that over this relatively short period, we became so much more productive and so much more efficient that we could continue to increase our consumption and actually quite, quite importantly, while working less in Europe. Uh, since 1995, um, GDP per capita started to slow down. It actually started uh, in the 1970. You can see that the, the curve is, is, is getting more and more concave over time. Uh, so the average is 1.1% uh, since 1995, and since 2004, it's only 0.7%. And we can compare with the US. In the US, the, the pattern is slightly different. Um, so the US here is in blue. And usually when, when this is presented, um, people say that it's quite, quite remarkable how you know, well approximated, the US GDP per capita dynamic is by a 2% straight line. Uh, and it's, it's, it's true that it works quite well, at least until the great financial crisis. And, you know, if you put aside uh, World War II and the Great Depression, but still it's, it's still remarkably constant up to 2007, which is not the case in Europe where, again, we see those two dynamics. There is a catching up after World War II with, with the US and then um, a slight di divergence that starts in the 1995. So if we put you know, all those two graphs together, we can get to this <coughs> ratio of, of uh, GB per capita across the two areas. And we can see quite clearly that uh, during the three decades that I mentioned, European, product, uh, European GDP per capita pretty much cons compensated this, this gap with respect to the US. Um, that was you know, uh, created after the Great Depression and during World War II. But since then, and especially since 1995, there is a growing divergence in terms of GDP per capita. And in 2022, we have the same relative gap as in 1970, right? So quite a substantial difference. There's many, many reasons for that. It doesn't necessarily capture difference in standard of living, but I think what's more worrying is that it's clearly increasing uh, over the, the, the recent period. Um, so if you want to understand the dynamic of the GDP per capita, we can make a very simple decomposition. That is probably way too simple for this audience, but we can just say that GDP per capita is equal to GDP per unit of labor, let's say a number of you know, hours worked in the total economy, so labor productivity, times labor utilization, labor divided by population. And since 1819, we got 20 times more productive, meaning that one unit of labor generates 20 more value than they used to in 1890. And this decomposition shows you that we could have decided to you know, use those 20-fold increase, either to decrease working time or to increase GDP per capita. So let's say increase consumption, increase investment. And in fact, if you look at the number in Europe, it's pretty much the same in the US, we multiply GDP per capita by 10 and divided working time by two. So essentially, most of what explains the dynamic of GDP per capita is um, how much efficient we were. And you know, we need to understand two things, the productivity gain, so how much efficient we are and why are we getting more efficient, but also what are our choice regarding how to use these gains, uh, either to consume or to you know, work less and increase leisure. And the choice that we made in Europe since especially 1990 is very different from what uh, has been done in the US. Okay, so in this, presentation, I will look at the driver of GDP per capita in Europe over the 
20th century, essentially, uh, you know, what happened after 1950. Uh, so that's the past part. Um, I will also look at the reason behind the slowdown that we experienced since 1995, which is the, the and, and what, you know, is happening since 2020, which is the present part, and then we'll discuss a little bit about the future of urine productivity regarding two important topics, artificial intelligence and um, green innovation and the environmental transition. Okay, so let's start with what I call the past, which is, you know, everything up to 1995. We can, you know, using historical data, we can extend a little bit the decomposition that I showed. We can say that GDP per capita, using a very simple uh, solo accounting framework, can be decomposed into um, labor productivity, which itself is measured as a product of total factor productivity, which here is really simply the solar residual, times capital intensity, and then employment over population and average working time per employee. Okay, if you take this decomposition, you get to GDP per capita, which means that if you just take this in the logarithm, you can look at uh, how much of the increase in GDP per capita is explained by each of those um, of the four factors. And we can, of course, say that GDP per capita is GDP times, uh, I mean, divided by population. So, in fact, what this graph is showing is that uh, the black dot here is GDP, growth rate. It's an average 3%, 3.2% in the US, uh, a little less in Europe, 2.5%. But actually, most of the differences between Europe and the US is due to this red area, which is uh, population. So, population was much more dynamic in the US, thanks to, essentially thanks to migration waves. Uh, that explains why GDP, on average, in the U.S. grew much faster than in Europe. But if you take aside this red area, what you would see is that, in fact, you know, there is a slight difference in terms of TFP, which is the yellow, um, the yellow part. And also, Europe works a little less than the U.S., which is the negative contribution, the blue area, which plays negatively to explain GDP per capita. Um, but essentially, you know, looking at the full 1980-2022 period, it's not so clear um, whether there is huge differences between the US and Europe, except maybe for, for you know, G, um, population. But we can um, go a little more micro in a sense and just take the logarithm of the previous relationship and compare dy the dynamic of the US and Europe, which gets you this graph. Uh, essentially, this is you know, decomposing the gap in terms of GDP per capita between Europe and the US, the gap in level, into those four components, TFP, capital intensity, um, um, employment rates, and, to, and average working time. And what you can see is that, in fact, what happened during the 1950-1980 period is that most of the dynamic in Europe is essentially coming from Europe resolving its TFP differences with respect to the US. This is the yellow area that is you know, coming almost to zero at the end of the catching up period. There is also more investment relatively to the US. This is this uh, orange area. It's coming to zero at the end. So there is, by 1995, there is no difference between the US and Europe in terms of how much they invest divided by population, divided by employment. But in fact, what happened after 1995 is that um, TFP, the, the catching up in terms of TFP stopped. And actually, uh, the gap start to open again after 1995. But on top of it, what played positively for Europe with respect to the US before 1970, the blue and, and green um, areas here, started to play negatively, which means that Europe started to decrease relatively more employment rates and average working time with respect to the US. And that's you know, coming from collective choice and European preferences for more leisure or, or less uh, working time than the US, but with less TFP gains as opposed to what we experienced during the catching up phase. This means that growth is going to be uh, mechanically lower than what we had in the US. And that explains part of the increasing gap in GDP per capita between Europe and the US. It's coming essentially from TFP, so US economy getting a bit more productive than the European economy, and on top of it, European working is slightly less than Americans. So we might wonder, in fact, when we look at this picture, uh, you may say, okay, the, this widening gap is, is very puzzling and maybe there's something to say about it, but essentially what's impressive is this catching up that occurs right after World War II. And 
may wonder what, what you know, made this possible. And the answer is probably very complicated, but quite simply, uh, after World War II, and thanks to um, a lot of investment coming from the US, Europe developed institutions that favor investment to replace all capital. Okay, so this is this increase in capital deepening in the, the, the orange area that we saw before, coming up to zero uh, during the 1970s. And all Europe also increases total factor productivity by you know, catching up to the US, relying on a relatively educated population after World War II. So all they had to do is to increase the supply of um, graduate students and that mechanically generated TFP gains. Here TFP also capture uh, human capital in this very simple framework. And also relative success in terms of country-specific industrial policies, and especially in Germany, where um, the competitive framework that was put in place in West Germany after World War II really helped the creation of uh, manufacturing giants that started to compete with the US. But we can also think that this catching up is slightly overestimated in the sense that a lot of it was actually very easy to get. Um, I'll show you evidence that European firms massively adopted US technologies. Actually, US firms, if you look at the share of patents filed in France and in Germany uh, over this long period, we now have data to, to measure that very precisely. You can see that that's the right uh, hand side graph. The share increased for about 10% before World War II to 25% very quickly. So there's a lot of patents coming from US firms that are filed in, the, in French and German patent office. This is the only two patent offices for which we have detailed data, which suggests that you know, those firms, and this is essentially coming from those superstar firms, uh, IBM, Kodak, GA, uh, General Motors, they are filing a lot of patents because they start to commercialize their own innovation and their own products in Europe. And this generated this quote by a, a French civil servant in 1967, uh, which basically was uh, worried that um, you know, American industry in Europe were getting so, 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 so dominant that it will supersede whatever we generated ourselves in Europe. So that's one of the reasons why it was actually quite easy to grow at this time. We didn't really need to design our own industrial policy. We got kind of flooded by um, US firms selling their own innovation and their own new technologies to the European market. The second reason why uh, we can think that this is slightly overestimated is that at this time Europe relied, pretty much like the US, uh, to, on an almost unlimited supply of cheap energy, and that would be oil, and we mentioned that uh, a lot this morning. But if you look at data, macroeconomic data from 1950, uh, the x-axis here is uh, GDP per capita in log, and the y-axis is consumption of oil per capita. And what we see is that in Europe, between 1950 and 1974, which is this, first part in blue, the correlation is extremely high. It's actually the R2 is close to 100%, which means that whenever GDP per capita increased by 1%, oil consumption increased by the same amount. And that was true for 24 years until um, the oil crisis. And afterward, you see that GDP started to uh, decelerate, and this is why the dots are you know, closer on the horizontal axis. But also, oil consumption didn't increase anymore in Europe, which means that in a sense, for an economy that was essentially manufacturing at this time, it's not that hard to increase your, 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 your production. You only need to you know, add more oil, which is your main input. And that was artificially cheap due to geopolitics uh, and, and, and pressure made by, by the you know, uh, Americans and other, uh, other political forces at this time. So again, it was not that hard to grow at this time. Oil was cheap and it was very much correlated with GDP per capita, and also um, US firms started to commercialize all those technologies, selling them to, to European firms and to European consumers. By the way, if you look at what you know, this graph looks like in the US, it's very different, which we can also give you an idea of how important the oil shock was for the European economy. In the US first, the correlation is slightly lower during the period 1950. You still see the entry of firms like Intel in the, in the 1970s, that managed to compete quite efficiently with uh, IBM. And then, of course, European firms uh, face the competition of US and then Japanese firms, which, you know, as a result um, of those industrial policies, Europe missed the IT revolution. And 
we can see it with a bunch of, of numbers. This is TFP, uh, gross filtered. Um, so just to give you an idea of what is the dynamic of long-term TFP gains. And if you look at Europe in red, you see this massive wave of productivity that is coming from the second industrial revolution right after the Second World War. But what you don't see, contrary to the US, is that there is no wave during the 90s that is um, attributed to uh, the ICT revolution. So the US benefited from not a huge gain of TFP if you compare to previous industrial revolution, but still there is a, a wave of productivity during the 90s, which you don't see in Europe. That's the aggregate, of course, but we can look slightly more detail and take sectoral data. Um, if you split uh, European, uh, if you split sectors into two categories, say ICT intensive and you know not ICT intensive sectors, uh, what you see is that in fact, so the blue here, blue lines are for the US. Uh, if you look at the dashed line, those are sectors that are below the median in terms of ICT intensity. And what you see is that labor productivity, which is the outcome variable here, is not so different between the two regions. It increased slightly from you know, about 10 percentage points over the full 1995, 20, 2019 period in the US, a little less in, in Europe, but not, you know, not a dramatic difference. But if you look at above median ICT sectors, then you see that there is an increase by about uh, 2.1 in the US, 2.2, and in Europe only by 1.4. So massive difference uh, between those sectors in terms of labor productivity over this 25 year period. And in fact, um, we can relate it to the aggregate productivity gap between the two regions, and this explains at least 20% of productivity growth rate differences between the two regions. Um, we can also do a regression to confirm it, but let me, let me move directly to the next part. So the present, 1995-2024 uh, should be. So what, uh, what do we see if we zoom into what happened during this period. So first what you see is that labor productivity between the Euro area and the US really follow the different dynamics. So, you know, the extent of the gap is, could be debated uh, whether we should use uh, purchasing power parity adjusted uh, GDP or whether the denominator, which is the number of hours worked, is comparable across the two countries. Probably not, but still the fact that you know, this gap is really clearly increasing for more than 30 years. Um, that's something that is worrying and, and, and is quite, um, quite significant. But even if you don't like comparison, what we can do is take the euro area and compare its dynamics from before the great financial crisis, so before 2007, compared to the pre, um, to the pre great financial crisis trend. Okay, so this is labor productivity to which I removed the trend calculated from the period 1970 to 2007. And what you see is that compared to this trend, we are in 2022, about 25 percentage, 25 percent lower than what we should be um, if we had followed this trend. And actually, if you look carefully, what you would see is that a lot of the loss has actually been made after the great, the, so first after the Euro crisis, but also after the pandemics. You can, zoom into this period and you would see that actually a lot of the gain even compared to this 2011-2020 trend is actually coming from what's happening after 2021. Can I go back? Yeah. Okay, so, um, you know, clearly there's something happening since 1995 but also since 2020. So, you know, there are short-term causes to explain what's happening after 2020. Uh, there's obvious shocks that uh, I don't think I really need to, to remind you. And, and actually, we can show with a regression that due to um, pandemics and the recent invasion of Ukraine, um, the disruption in the manufacturing sectors impacted much more labor than output, which explains why labor productivity started to, to slow down uh, quite significantly in Europe. Uh, in fact, firms reduced their output and they, to some extent, they maintained their, their workforce. Uh, active but, but not producing, which you know is explained by the fact that uh, there are hiring difficulties and, and firms were quite, quite reluctant to let go their, their skilled workforce. Um, there's also disruption of global value chains, and we know that this impacts um, productive firms more strongly, but I guess you will discuss that tomorrow more extensively. 
and some evidence that limited evidence though that you know the supports uh, policy that were implemented during the pandemics created some zombie firms. It seems that this issue is not really uh, doesn't really matter anymore, and like exit rates started to increase again up to the pre-pandemic level. So maybe this is uh, not such a relevant cause. But in fact, um, what I mostly care about in this presentation is not, you know, those maybe maybe short-term causes that that will be resolved in the next years. It's mostly the structural causes that explain why there is such a big divergence since 1995 between Europe and the US. Um, there's three possible reasons. The first one that I won't have a lot to say is that if you look at working time, there is something quite interesting in Europe is that we never got back to the pre-pandemic trend, right? So average working time per capita is about 20 hours lower than what it was uh, before the pandemic, which could, could reflect you know, change in preferences. Um, I don't know, that's something that uh, maybe some, some people have worked on. Um, what I will be mostly talking about now is two, two other aspects. The misallocation of R&D, which is linked to the fact that we have uh, a big, um, we are lagging behind in terms of um, high technology in Europe compared to the US and even compared to China. Okay, so in terms of misallocation of R&D, there is a fact that is quite uh, striking, I think, which is that if you compare US and Europe, Europe invests 2.3% of its GDP in R&D. Uh, Europe, yes, and the US is 3.4%, so it's a full one percentage point of the US GDP that is invested in the US on top of what Europe can do, which is, of course, quite, quite substantial. But in fact, if you look at public R&D expenditures, I told you that the US is around 1%, but Europe is also around 1%. So it's not a matter of the public sector not spending enough in terms of R&D. It's mostly a matter of the private sector not following up with its own investment. And, and the, the bulk of the gap between the US and Europe is, is really much coming from the, the private sector. So one important question is not that you know, we should spend more in terms of R&D. The question is, how do, how do those public um, R&D expenditures are located in such a way that they do not generate this um, follow-up innovation by the private sector. And in fact, this comes back to an issue that was uh, put forward by a recent report by an um, economist at Bocconi uh, that introduced this middle technology trap, which is very much the idea that Europe is, is actually spending a lot of R&D in technologies that are very much uh, you know, all these technologies where German firms uh, excel, like cars, um, appliance manufacturing, chemistry, and not a lot of technologies in, uh, obviously, uh, what we would call high technology, which is uh, IT, AI, uh, but also biotech and nanotechnologies. And in those technologies, Europe is essentially absent. If you look at a top patenting firm, this is actually 1995, not 2005. So we could look at who are the, the main firms patenting at this time. Um, in the US, you would find Procter Gamble, 3M, GE, Dupont, Qualcomm. In Europe, Siemens, Bosch, Ericsson, Philips, Bath. So pretty much the same you know, type of firm. They cover a wide range of the economy, but essentially in manufacturing. If you do the same exercise in 2023, in, Euro in the US, you will find, beside Qualcomm, new firms that didn't exist uh, among the top patenters in 1995. In the euro area, you would find the exact same uh, five firms. In fact, they are still here, and there are still those patenting, uh, except for one uh, switch. But they are still, you know, the firms finding the most patents. And that's the idea behind um, this middle technology trap. We can, you know, not focus on the top of the distribution, but just look at the total number of patents filed. So this is patents file under the PCT, which is patents that you can, you know, international patents, let's say, so they are very useful to compare countries. Um, if you look at overall patent file across four regions, Japan in yellow, the US in red, China in blue, and Europe in uh, green, what you see is that, well, you do see China starting to file more and more patents since 2001, but essentially, you see that they took over uh, the US, but also Europe, but Europe still maintained quite a large position, around 20% of the total number of patent files. 
if you look at high technology patterns, so again, biotech, nanotech, ICT, here you see that China is pretty much eating up all of the European shares, and Europe accounts for less than 10% of the total number of patents uh, by 2020. You can, and we have looked with a co-author into very specific technologies just to make sure that, you know, this is not driven by some specific type of technologies, and essentially we see the same pattern everywhere, and in some technologies, Europe is essentially zero in terms of the number of patents, that's true in computer vision, uh, blockchain, which when we started was uh, very, very popular. Uh, genome editing, it, maybe self-driving vehicle and hydrogen storage are, are two exceptions. But in many, many high technologies, you would see that Europe is uh, taking less and less relative importance as opposed to the US and China. So I agree with you that pro and probably you may, you may react to those graphs by saying that this is essentially showing that China is taking over uh, the world. But actually, if you look at the final picture, uh, the very last, uh, you know, the end of the, of the time uh, period, you see that we started from a world where Japan, Europe, and the U.S. had significant share of patents in some technologies, and now it's essentially uh, China and the U.S. And something that um, I, want, uh, I will come back to this slide, but something that I find quite, um, you know, maybe hopeful but also a bit depressing is that when you took those patents that I mentioned, that I showed you before, and you look at the content of the patents, and patents are pretty much like academic paper, right? They cite uh, previous art, but they also cite academic paper that they use to generate their ideas. So really like the raw, the, the source of the ideas that are in the patents. And if you look at where the authors of those, those paper are, are affiliated, they are disproportionately more affiliated in Europe than uh, the share of patent would suggest, right? So most of the authors are based in US universities, but around 30, 25 to 30% of the authors are actually based in Europe, which is much more than the share of patents that are filed by European firms. And that suggests that Europe has the capabilities to generate you know, very um, frontier knowledge in its universities. But essentially, Chinese and US firms benefit from this knowledge. So we struggle to create the connection between firms and universities. And I think, uh, this come back again to this idea that is uh, well developed in the Draghi report, which is that European innovation policies are, are insufficiently coordinated. And in fact, you know, the, 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 the plagues that have been um, discussed during the post-war period, in spite of quite impressive number in terms of GDP per capita, they are, still, they are still there. The large market is more exploited than it was in the 70s, but it's still insufficiently exploited. Um, we still def develop our innovation policy essentially nationally, and we, we still want to maintain some level of uh, territorial equality across country, which obviously is not efficient enough if you want to create um, this innovation policy that fully benefits from the size of the market. Um, this morning we, we mentioned capital markets. Um, not sure this is a solution either, but uh, it's clear that capital market is insufficient, insufficiently integrated. And also the organization of research agency does not really um, reward high risk uh, and very uncertain uh, projects. It's actually uh, quite striking if you look at the way European agency organized during the pandemics uh, compared to uh, the US agencies and, um, you know, it's pretty Pretty much not a surprise that uh, the BARDA was the one uh, coming up with the most efficient investment and without the BARDA probably we wouldn't be here today to, to discuss. We will still be on Zoom uh, doing this conference remotely. Um, the reason is that the way they organize the, the, the public subsidies to laboratories was essentially to give a dozen of different teams equal opportunity to develop a new vaccine, knowing perfectly that only one had to succeed. Whereas in Europe, the idea was very much to put full steam on one, uh, one or two technologies. And of course, with this kind of very uncertain project, this is much less efficient. Um, the other issue is that European innovation policy is essentially focusing on one type of instrument, which is R&D uh, R&D subsidies or tax credits. And that's um, not super efficient in the sense that it's very hard to direct those uh, tax credits to the right firms. So those are essentially very hor horizontal uh, policies that will 
even if you try to target you know, young firms or small firms, thinking that those are the firms that will have the most, the, high, the highest potential to generate disruptive innovation and maybe the one that wouldn't do any R&D expenditure without those uh, support. Well, it's not so clear that those are actually the firms that will have the most capabilities to generate radical innovation. In fact, probably the reason why firms will be able to generate radical innovation is essentially unobserved. And I think there's relatively less, you know, uh, little, we, we know that firms are heterogeneous in many, many aspects, right? And there's many, many models that, that use this heterogeneity and show that it matters. Um, so it's clear that there is heterogeneity also in how much you can benefit from R&D tax credits. But it's likely that this heterogeneity is unobservable by the government. So those policies, those instruments that will give a tax credit based on some observable quantity like employment, age, or R&D expenditure, they are not necessarily super efficient. One thing that could work and a bit related to what I showed before that universities in Europe are, are still quite innovative, maybe to rely a bit more on the spillovers from the public sector to private research um, by subsidi subsidizing more um, laboratories that commit to participate to those kind of uh, spillovers with the private sector, so to, to collaborate more with the private sectors. Actually, many evidence that, again, this is uh, something that uh, was quite important historically in the US after World War II. And, um, but also in Europe, so I have um, a recent evaluation of a program in France that is very simple, not very expensive. It was a billion euros uh, given to some laboratories over a period of 10 years uh, with the counterpart that they would have to collaborate with local um, firms. And this, you know, has causal sizable effect in R&D expenditure. So firms do follow up, not all firms, but actually those firms that have the capabilities to do, do so. They, they, they will follow up if you give them uh, additional inputs for their research. Um, and I think this is something that should be emphasized more in European innovation policy. Okay, so now the future. I'm uh, essentially going to talk about AI um, and to think about what we can expect in terms of productivity um, due to AI. So there's be, you know, many, many things have been said about AI and productivity, and it's obviously at this stage still very, very uncertain what will happen, but we can think that AI will impact productivity through many different channels. Some are very common to other technologies, and essentially ICT. Um, AI can automate some tasks and actually free up time for more creative and more valuable activities. So essentially, you would use AI to do those tasks that are you know, very time consuming, but essentially no value is created for them. That's part of what we call the automation channel. AI can also enhance workers' efficiency by working in complementarity with the workers. So we are collectively much more efficient when we use AI to generate uh, you know, our output than without AI. Although that's, you know, there's some, some um, contrast, contrasting evidence, but we, we should be more efficient. So that's also part of the automation channel. But there are also one additional channel that is still a bit, um, again, uncertain at this time, which is that, you know, AI is very different from other technologies in the sense that AI can generate ideas um, or generate new business, new, new products, new ideas, new services. Uh, but if you think that AI can automate the production of ideas, which again is still a bit uncertain, then there could be, you know, important um, effect on R&D efficiency if even researchers start to work with AI to, to solve a very important problem, and ultimately on TFP, which is a channel from which, you know, I won't have a lot to say quantitatively because at this stage it's very uncertain whether AI will help us find a solution to those uh, first world problems, but technically it's, it's possible. And finally, obviously, to, to implement this technology, firms are going to have to, to invest a lot, which um, will increase capital deepening, and then um, this will have some effect on GDP. Um, AI also have, you know, pretty much everything that qualify it as a general purpose technology. And so we may wonder whether this will have some effect that are comparable in size to what we experience with other GPT, such as um, computer, or electricity, or even the steam engine. So let, let's, you know, let's see what we can say. There is a recent paper by Darren Asimoglu that is very useful to conceptualize this. Uh, it basically used this task-based model that uh, was developed in the previous paper in the context of robotization. 
to come up with a way to estimate the automation channel. So in this paper, Asimoglu is quite adamant in um, the fact that the effects are going to be quite disappointing, uh, at least from the automation channel. Um, but the good, I mean, one useful aspect of this model is that it's essentially, it essentially only requires four numbers that can be estimated in many different countries. The share of GDP accounted by tasks for which AI can be very efficient at uh, substituting workers. Uh, the share of this task for which it will actually be cost effective to use AI because it's not only that you need, you, you know, you have a task that can be done by AI, it's also that uh, it needs to be uh, realistically cost effective to use AI for this task. You cannot replace, uh, you know, a baker with AI. It's probably feasible technically, but it's going to be much, way too expensive. Uh, the third number is the average saving cost from AI adoption, which is how much more efficient worker will be with AI in those tasks that are um, easily uh, substitutable by AI. And finally, the labor share. So all this is something we can measure. Um, and if you want to get some number into, put some number into this, um, we have to take a stand in what will be the share of task that AI, the share of GDP, the share of employment that AI would be able to, to substitute. And again, if we want to think about this question, we really need to take this task-based approach that uh, has been developed by the literature, essentially in the context of the previous automation wave. And here what I did is that I took uh, the ONET data that was mentioned in, in previous uh, presentation today, uh, which lists, I think, 18,000 18, tasks. So there's a short description of what those tasks are about. And then for each occupation, um, the worker is reporting, you know, how much of his t time in a regular day this task um, is, uh, is done. And so what we did here is that we actually use AI to kind of give a score of um, how much this task could be realistically done by AI based on the current capabilities of AI. So as of today, uh, can AI easily uh, do one of those tasks? And then we look at the composition in terms of task of a standard worker in many occupations, and we can define this AI exposure index, which is, uh, thanks, which is uh, ranking occupation based on, again, what is the share of tasks that can be done by AI. But then again, it's, so you see that accountant, telemarker, but also translator and, and jurists and journalists and architects, they are quite high in terms of this um, exposure index at least based on the standard uh, tasks that they are doing today that may change, but if you take those occupations as they are today, this is what we get. And on the other side of the distribution, you get uh, you know, manual workers um, that mostly do uh, tasks that cannot be done by AI. But then um, there is an additional dimension, which is, again, it's not only because a task can be done by AI that the full occupation is going to disappear, First, because this task may account for a very small share of its uh, full day, regular day, but also because, in fact, these tasks do not really account for most of the value that uh, this worker is uh, producing. And so we define something that we call tasks that are hard to automate in the sense that it will either be too costly for the firms to do it, based on you know, the, the, the cost saving that uh, the firm will, will uh, could benefit from, from automating those tasks. But also from the fact that those tasks, even though they take some time in a regular day, they are not so considered so important by the firm. And that's why we have this additional uh, axis, which is the x-axis, which essentially uh, rank occupation based on how unlikely they are going to be automated, which explains why you would see that jurist or physician, even though some part of those tasks that they do could be automated. At the end of the day, it's very unlikely that those occupations are going to be automated. So if you're in the northwest part of this graph, uh, that suggests that uh, this occupation is very much uh, threatened by AI. Again, unless you know the occupation adapt, which is very likely, especially given the, the time length it will take for AI to, to diffuse. And you can see that it's not such a huge share. So I should have said that the, the size of the bin is the size of, in terms of employment. So it's not a huge share of employment. Um, at the end of the day, it accounts for less than 15, 10% of employment, uh, which is also why Asimoglu came up with quite disappointing number. Uh, then the third question, if you remember the third number, was how much more efficient we get with AI compared to, to, to what we are currently. So there's some RCT that have been done very quickly after uh, 
um, the, the development of generative AI. So this is essentially based on generative AI, but in, again, in those occupations that are very much impacted by AI, we see that uh, workers are faster, uh, more precise, they're even more creative. There is a study that looked at uh, double-blind uh, competition in terms of creative uh, stories, and actually people using generative AI create more, you know, better stories in a sense. There's also some um, counter examples, essentially in the medical sectors, where um, we realize that um, you know doctors, medical doctors, may be quite inefficient with AI, essentially because they tend to trust AI too much in part where they shouldn't trust AI. For example, radiologists would trust AI way too much in analyzing some of the radio. And on the contrary, they would uh, not rely on the AI too much in part where they should actually delegate to AI. So it's, it's not that easy to also uh, interact with AI in the sense that you really need to be trained in understanding what can you fully delegate to AI and then relocate your time to those tasks that are more important. Probably those gains will increase in the future. But at the end, what we retain is a 35% increase in efficiency, which is already quite substantial. But again, only on those tasks that are very much um, relevant for AI, right? So you can think of developers, uh, you can think of analysts, and um, all those kind of tasks. So then if we take some number, we have GDP, the share of GDP uh, that AI could automate, 45%, basic. Um, the share of data that could be effectively automated, only 40%, so you have to multiply those two, and at the end you get to less than 20% uh, of the task that could be automated realistically. On those 20%, you will get a 35% increase, and that's only coming from the labor part of GDP, which explains how you get those numbers in terms of GDP. So again, you know, just here to give some, uh, some magnitude, so some order of magnitude. So by the, you know, by the time it will take for uh, AI to diffuse up to the point that all this will be implemented, so all this substitution in the labor market will be done, we don't, let's say it will take 10 years, this is what Asimoglu also assumes, you know, the gains are not huge. So Belgium is actually the number one, but basically they are all in the same ballpark, which is, you know, 0 0.3, uh, let's say if, in, if it's in 10 years, 0 0.3 increasing growth, um, so plus 0 0.3 percentage point in growth, which will be probably welcome, but cl clearly much below uh, what we would expect if you think that AI would be one of the GPT that, that could generate huge CFP gains. The thing is that this is only coming from the automation channel, and this is only coming from adopting current products. So we can think that if you believe this methodology and if you believe those numbers, this is something that is quite guaranteed at this stage. Uh, there's actually evidence that European firms are um, adopting AI, current AI, at the same rate as the US firm. So, you know, pretty much this is uh, some gain that has to be expected in the near future. But this is still quite disappointing. And in fact, most of the gain from AI are going to come from the ability of firms to use AI to develop their own resources and their own model in order to create new services and then generate some values um, in terms of, um, uh, I mean, you know, in terms of resources. So, for example, you can think of, uh, just one minute, um, you know, journals, uh, the newspaper that will... Uh, could use AI to just automatically generate articles and save costs, and it doesn't have to use journalists anymore, but you know, there's only so many articles that you will be willing to read every day, so it's not like there is a huge margin that you could uh, gain from this adoption. Uh, all this newspaper can also use AI to develop a new service uh, that will generate articles that are tailored based on uh, the, you know, whatever data they have on their customers, whatever data they have on a specific customer based on what he, he, you know, the type of article that he usually reads, based on the huge amount of data that this newspaper have accumulated over time. And then you can develop a new service for which customers may be willing to pay more, and that will generate much more value than um, just automating some task. For that, you would need um, probably firms to be able to create those new models themselves, or at least to collaborate with uh, IT firm that can um, pretty much help them to, to develop these, uh, these topics. And here again, uh, Europe is slightly lagging behind, is lagging behind in terms of innovation in AI. This is patenting in AI, so maybe not the perfect measure, but um, um, Europe has uh, like only 450 
patents in AI every year compared to the US, which is uh, three times this number, and China and Japan, which we, you know, we all file much more patents. But again, if you look at articles written in academic journals, and you pile up all those European countries that are in orange here, you get to, when you adjust for citation, 11 million articles, which is pretty much the same level as in the US. So again, you know, European universities manage to generate a lot of research, a lot of frontier knowledge, but uh, we don't see it in the patent data or in investment. I think I have to stop. Uh, I had stuff to say about uh, green transition, but maybe we can take it offline if you care. Okay, we just leave it. Thanks.